Hello everyone, uh, my name is Human Pedro Satchot and uh, in this lecture I'm going to talk about multithreading with Java. In this lecture, first uh, I explain very briefly the basics of uh, threads and then I will explain how to implement multithread programs in Java. Later we will see that uh, multi-threading can create undesired situations in the program logic, in the program's logic. Therefore uh, I will explain the problems that could raise and I'll also uh, explain how to solve those problems using synchronization of threads. And also in the end I will explain the concurrent utilities provided by uh, as packages and frameworks in Java. So first we start with the concept of process and uh, threads. So uh, we would like to know what is a process. A process is a unit of activity uh, I see if I can manage. This is the first time I'm using this type of electronic pens. Yes. So it's a unit of activity characterized by a sequence of instructions, a current state, and an associated set of system resources. And each process has a, w at least one thread and more, maybe. But what is a thread? A thread is a path of execution in a process uh, that is characterized by an execution state, execution stack, and uh, local variables. We start uh, with an example. Let's explain this with an example. In this example, we assume that uh, we have a uh, process um, P1 right and uh, that has only a single thread and in this thread uh, the logic of this program let's say is that it processes uh, something and then uh, it needs to during uh, its process sends two requests that are not actually dependent on each other to a server. For example, you can assume that these two requests are from two different clients that it needs to process. And this server can be a query that is a external a remote database. So what happens in a single thread process is that uh, it needs to process the first request first and then send the uh, query to the server and then receive the response and then process the request to and then sends the query to server to and that's it. So there are the waiting time, the black uh, colors are the waiting time, right? However, if our program, the process P1, could have uh, two threads, right? It could have two threads, T1, T2, that T1 could process request first request and send the request to whenever it is created right to the second uh, server. Therefore the waiting times uh, for getting response from the server could overlap and therefore this could create less uh, execution time, right? And much faster and higher throughput it means. So this is the benefit of threads and multi-threading which is very uh, in detail explained in the course in the operating system courses especially okay so I delete the um, thanks. okay what are the benefits of uh, threads right creating threads takes less time than creating new processes right and terminating threads takes less time than terminating processes therefore it is always uh, better to use 
uh, multi-threaded programs rather than multiple processes that's why threads uh, are uh, best practices uh, in these scenarios and also switching between threads takes less time there are, because it has less overhead on the operating system context switching among processes as it has and threads in a process can communicate to each other without interference of kernel which can reduce the uh, overhead and processing time and the benefits of multi-threading in a distributed application in a distributed application multi-threading can be beneficial in several aspects for example multiple threads in a client server both on the client side and on the server side can be helpful on the client side multi-threading can help you to hide uh, the communication latency and uh, it can create a responsive user interface there are typically two threads uh, one to interact with the uh, user uh, via the uh, user interface and another thread will be interacting with the server for example making a TCP connection to a remote server so these two threads communicate with each other through a shared buffer or by method invocation on the communication thread object for example if it wants to stop it and the communication thread passes server responses to the uh, UI thread by the uh, GUI callbacks uh, or through shared buffers you can see as an example uh, a uh, client uh, as a client side a messenger application right that uh, you can actually at the same time chat with multiple uh, of your friends and uh, while the messages are being sent over the network you are sending uh, video or files over the network you can still interact and switch between the friends and uh, you can still interact with your application so uh, this is done with multiple threads so you can also access to shared buffers these two threads to access to the shared buffers uh, they should be synchronized in order to create uh, correct uh, states on the shared buffer that we will explain in the uh, following uh, slides all right I remove this okay and now on the server side multi-threading can improve scalability of the uh, server for having higher throughput in fact one thread can just listen on the server port for clients requests and whenever it receives a client request it can create a thread which is called usually a worker thread for each client that is connected and each client is served in its own thread on the server and the listening thread uh, should provide uh, client information to the worker uh, thread or servicing thread typically servicing threads are uh, independent but might access to the shared resources for example these shared resources can be uh, database uh, to fetch uh, uh, clients data and therefore might need to be synchronized on reaching and accessing the uh, shared resources okay now we explain uh, the multi-threading in Java and how we can implement uh, multi-thread application in Java a Java thread is a lightweight process that is represented by the object of a class thread uh, 
that this class has two uh, methods start and run and actually there is a stack and program counter register the program counter register uh, assigned to this uh, thread and uh, the thread can access all the variables in its own scope each thread has a method uh, with a signature void uh, run that actually this uh, run method um, is executed when the thread starts is called and this thread vanishes when it returns from the run method so actually when the logic written in the run method finishes the thread will be destroyed and you must implement as a developer the body of the run method and the classes for multi-threading are thread and a thread group and actually thread group is used uh, for grouping several multiple threads in one so you can actually uh, give some of the commands uh, as a collective to these threads and there is also a public interface in Java called Runnable that actually mm, uh, is used uh, for uh, implementing uh, threads as well uh, for example the class thread itself is implementing a runnable method there are two ways to implement uh, a Java thread the first way to program it is to use directly the class thread so actually by extending this class uh, yeah, you can override the run method and define other methods if needed and then create and start the thread by calling by instantiating this class and calling the start method another way to create a uh, to implement the thread in Java is you implement a runnable interface in a class and uh, this class then represents tasks we can call it tasks that can be implemented by a thread and again the, the logic of this task will be written in the body of the run method and then uh, you can start the thread by creating an object of a uh, uh, runnable and giving it to this thread to be executed so in fact the task will be given to a thread to be executed we will see with a demonstration in the following slide this is uh, the uh, signature of the class thread that as you can see itself uh, implements um, the uh, runnable interface so it has these public constructors that uh, you can pass actually a runnable uh, object to it or uh, assign the name of the thread and also it has a uh, method start that is a native method which means that it has some non-java uh, implementation under the hood uh, which can actually fork an operating system level thread for this process for this thread but actually by running the start the body of the run method will uh, be called so this is where the logic of your uh, thread will be implemented and the interface runnable is actually just enforcing your application to uh, implement the run method <coughs> so uh, let's see how we can extend a thread 
to create a thread called output thread. So we can actually uh, give a name to the constructor of the superclass, which will be the thread. And also we can implement the uh, body of the run method that is a simple uh, for loop uh, that is actually running for three times and uh, yielding every time. And yield method actually enforces, uh, which may uh, enforces the um, operating system to context switch between the threads. Uh, not enforcing, but actually yield means it the current thread will be enforced to lose the uh, to release the CPU uh, for other thread and letting other thread to be executed. And actually, as you can see, this thread is simply uh, trying to run for three times its own name right and how we can instantiate this thread and use it in another class we actually create a main method to test our thread so we create two threads and we instantiate it and we give a name uh, one and two to each and as you can see we call the start method in each thread so therefore you'll see as an output uh, uh, one two one two one two and um, st when you start a thread uh, what happens when you uh, when the application calls the start method the start method will go and execute the run method and the run method is actually the logic that you wrote as the developer of this application which is this for loop in the case of implementing your thread with runnable uh, it's like you implement your class uh, your class you implement uh, your in your class uh, the runnable interface and uh, you create uh, the for loop and it prints as you can see here since this class is not inheriting anything from uh, the class thread therefore it does not have access to the yield method therefore you can use the static yield method of the thread class by calling thread current thread yield and in our test class we again instantiate each of these tasks with a given name and we need to create threads and giving our tasks to it as you can see here and then we start it and we will get the same behavior which is printing out one two one two to demonstrate uh, how uh, the runnable task works when it's running uh, you can see that uh, the after calling the start method of the uh, T1 um, actually the runnable method which the runnable ad, uh, object is given to the instance of the T1 and therefore whenever the T1 start method is called it calls its own run method which is in fact referring by, uh, to the run method of the out one task and therefore in the end of the day uh, it's running the same logic that you wrote
so when you start a thread by calling the start method uh, starts a new thread f in the context of uh, operating system level and uh, the caller returns immediately the the main thread that calls actually the, the object of T and uh, caller and thread run in parallel what if you want to wait for a thread to finish and do not return immediately your main thread you don't want to return immediately you can use the join method if you call the join method it blocks the color of this method and therefore it waits for the thread to finish and returns when the thread is done here we summarize some methods of the uh, class thread uh, we have seen the run and start that invokes the JVM uh, run method and the join is for waiting to the thread uh, to die and then continue yield causes a context switch between this thread and another threads and the slip method pauses the thread for a specific number of milliseconds that is given by a long value an interrupt method interrupts the current thread uh, from a pause state and the getters and setters for the for a thread are for example setting a name or setting a priority that uh, can give different priorities to thread uh, but in action maybe different priorities does not work as you want in a uh, default uh, by default uh, the threads are fared fairly receiving uh, conceptually fairly receiving the CPU clocks to run and you can actually define a daemon thread uh, that uh, makes your thread uh, not to become a uh, to wait thread it means that if your process dies uh, even if this thread was running will be killed but if a thread is not a daemon thread uh, even if the main thread dies uh, your non-daemon thread will still live but if you set a daemon thread your daemon thread will be running as um, far as uh, other non-daemon threads are running if other non-daemon threads are killed then your daemon thread will be killed also so here we can see the uh, state diagram of a thread and its life cycle so when you create a new thread by running it starts it goes to a runnable method and even when you call yield still your thread is in runnable mode but it's just not receiving perhaps a CP clock and it's in the queue to receive it and when you call sleep wait and join your thread can go to suspended mode and it will actually come back to runnable method by notifying a thread or finishing this slip time or the join ends or calling interrupt and a thread will be dead uh, when it returns from the run logic uh, or uh, it the system that exists is called it means that the process is killed threads can interact with each other with different methods and they run conceptually uh, concurrently and they need to communicate with each other there are different ways that you can make threads to communicate with each other one is by calling uh, methods and accessing variables of a thread object like ordinary objects the other thing is by using pipes TCP connections or via shared objects which is a very common pattern in a multi-threading uh, communication 
And what is a shared object? An object is shared when multiple concurrent threads invoke its methods and access its variables. So a uh, shared object is simply uh, like this object A, this object, sorry I'm not a good drawer, uh, let's say you have an object A, right, and uh, there are multiple threads trying to write and read from this object. Yeah, I know it's an ugly A, but I think my handwriting reality is like this also. <laughs> okay, so thread T1 and T2 at the same time are trying to access the variables of a shared object A. And what is a race condition in this case? Here uh, I explain race condition with an example. Uh, assume that there is a variable um, value and uh, it is set initially by uh, zero and uh, there is a method increment value that first increases the value by one and then uh, returns it, the value and what we want to uh, what we expect from this method is that to count the number of times that this method is called in fact so let's say now in this uh, scenario uh, what happens that let's say first thread one calls this method and uh, therefore it reads the value and gets 0 initially right and add 1 and what happens is that thread 1 when it reads the value it copies the value of this uh, field variable and adding it by 1 is just happening in the local copy of the thread 1 and uh, the value of the, the its local copy of the uh, variable is set to 1. Therefore if another thread at the same time uh, in parallel to thread 1 slightly after that comes uh, and call uh, this thread this method uh, what happens is that it gets the value 0 and it copies this value and adds it uh, locally by 1 and sets a value 1. Therefore, when T1 writes its local uh, copy to the field, the value will be 1 and therefore this method will be returned 1. And the problem is that the thread 2 will return an undesired uh, value of 1 as well and therefore uh, this will not uh, return the desired value and the correct state that it should be 2 in this step. This is called race condition and uh, to avoid race condition we need to run the methods atomically and letting threads to access the method uh, one by one by mutual exclusion. Uh, one way to avoid uh, race condition is by synchronized by creating synchronized methods and blocks, and uh, this allows uh, to create methods and uh, block code blocks that are uh, can be executed with mutual exclusion. The way to do it in Java is by using synchronized modifier that can be uh, written in the signature of the uh, method to actually define a mutual exclusion on for an entire method or, or for a code block. The way it works is that 
actually each object in Java has an implicit lock associated with the object and uh, each object also has an implicit condition variable that is called wait set If you want to define a synchronized block, it needs to have a lock uh, object. Or if you want to have a synchronized method, the same class actually can be used as a uh, lock, uh, the implicit uh, lock. I mean, so if a thread wants to uh, access a synchronized method or block, it needs to acquire the lock. Uh, and it is done implicitly. Also, a thread can actually signal to the other uh, uh, waiting threads uh, that are waiting to, for the lock to be released. We can see it with an example. So let's say we want to have a compute maximum value method that has actually initially set with it, that is set actually initially to the minimum possible value integer value and uh, it has a public method get max that is going to be called uh, with multiple threads and as you can see uh, the identifier synchronized is used uh, for this method so therefore it assures that this method will be called uh, atomically by threads and no two threads at the same time will access to this uh, part of the code and what it does is it checks if the current value of the class is greater than the maximum value uh, uh, of my apology if the current ma current value uh, max of the class is greater than the uh, is the smaller than the value given by the color thread uh, then it replaced the value of it which is a this is the uh, a simple uh, max computation and anyway it returns the current maximum value right so this will avoid a race condition that could happen uh, by multiple threads at the same time calling this method by making the whole method uh, synchronized the entire method synchronized but whether it can be implemented uh, more efficiently uh, yes actually uh, we can implement it we using the synchronized block that is uh, the difference is in this part that if the value given value actually you can see that we're not making the entire method uh, uh, synchronized therefore parallel threads can simultaneously run this part of the code they simultaneously can check if the current value is greater than max since if the current value if their given value is not greater than the max they don't need to wait and they just can return the current max it's a read operation therefore they don't have to acquire the lock and they just can return the current maximum we only need to synchronize those threads that their current value makes the uh, current value of the class to be re re uh, overwritten therefore we create a synchronized block using this current object as a lock object and we again check if still this condition is valid that uh, the threads uh, value is greater than the classes uh, maximum value therefore it 
rewrite, re overwrite it in that case. So therefore it is expected that this class will increase the throughput in case that there are few um, writes uh, and fewer uh, threads having a value more than the max value and mainly they need to just return the current value. Now we explain the monitors in Java. Uh, what we have seen so far about uh, using synchronized modifier and the implicit lock and the condition variables uh, is in fact a an implementation of monitors, the concept of monitors in Java. So a Java monitor is in fact an object of a class with synchronized methods which can be invoked by a thread at a time. And however a class may contain synchronized and also ordinary non-synchronized methods. So therefore non-synchronized methods can be executed without synchronization. And each monitor has an implicit monitor lock and as we have seen uh, there are there is an impl implicit condition variable. The methods that uh, affect in the scope of synchronized method are uh, wait, notify, and notify all. Uh, the wait method, a thread, a caller uh, of the wait method uh, will actually release the lock and be suspended, go to the uh, suspended mode. And a thread can signal by notify and notify all other uh, thread or threads that has been uh, suspended for a condition and therefore coming back uh, to try to take the lock again. And there is no priority weight actually and uh, there is a fair uh, queue for the threads that are waiting. And also it applies the signal and continue policy uh, for the color of notify and notify all, which means that the notify the color of the notify and notify all uh, will continue after calling these methods. Here in this example, um, you can see a concurrent data structure, uh, which uh, can. Uh, which is an implementation of a queue that can be used uh, by multiple threads at the time at the same time and uh, as you can see there is a synchronized uh, DQ method for that so as you can see each object of this queue has an implicit lock with an implicit condition it's a generic type queue which can uh, later be defined uh, the, the type of its items and uh, you can see that the synchronized modifier actually uh, lock on entry and uh, uh, unlock on return that uh, and also uh, the color of this uh, method if uh, it checks that uh, the uh, uh, if it checks that um, the uh, thread is actually uh, here, if the the queue is empty, uh, therefore it releases the lock and waits for the implicit condition, which will be uh, uh, notified by another thread later and uh, and whenever it dequeues an item it notifies all other threads that are waiting for the implicit condition uh, which means that it could be that the queue is full there are threads for waiting 
for a condition that the queue is full therefore they can try again to uh, uh, add another item to the queue and uh, by returning uh, it releases the lock so example one producer consumer it's a uh, very mm, common example uh, when it comes to multi-threading and concurrent programming which there are producer and consumer threads that are using a shared object or we can call it a uh, shared uh, cell uh, because it has only one uh, empty uh, slot for entering items uh, and uh, mm, that this producer and consumer they interact in a data flow fashion that the producer each time produces and consumer uh, consumes and this shared cell has two methods put and uh, take uh, that uh, the consumer uses the take method to uh, get the item from, uh, written uh, in the shared cell and the producer uses the put method to put the item in the shared cell and we implement the shared cell as a monitor to synchronize the producer and consumer therefore the methods put and take should be synchronized with mutual exclusion and uh, this will define an implicit condition variable uh, for synchronization of producer and consumer so to implement this first we implement the shared cell monitor so the way to implement this is uh, we uh, define a class we call it shared cell uh, that uh, the value uh, we define a variable uh, value of type integer to hold the uh, item in this cell and we define a boolean uh, variable to check whether uh, uh, the item was used consumed or not uh, we call it empty and the two methods if you see uh, uh, you can uh, note that uh, we use the identifier modifier synchronized for that for both of these uh, methods so first uh, we implement the take method there is a while on the condition while there is nothing in this uh, cell okay the thread should call the wait and re therefore releasing the lock and um, if by any case uh, any means uh, the thread is interrupted uh, this um, uh, exception will be raised by, by any other means I mean which for this case we are not going to handle and do anything but if the um, cell is not empty therefore this uh, call will make it empty and uh, by making it empty uh, we notify uh, one thread which is the consumer and the return the value if you see uh, if you note uh, you can see that the notify will call only one thread will notify one, only on, uh, one thread and this is because we uh, only uh, know that uh, there are two threads only using this uh, monitor one is the producer uh, that will call only the put method and the other is uh, the consumer that only calls the take method therefore if the producer uh, calls a notify method uh, it is signaling uh, the consumer thread and if the consumer thread uh, calls the uh, notify method it is in fact signaling the producer uh, 
So uh, for the put method, the conditions are uh, uh, the opposite, right? Uh, if it's not empty, then the um, the producer thread uh, should wait, and uh, uh, whenever uh, there is an uh, empty, uh, whenever uh, the shared cell is empty, therefore it sets the uh, new value. Uh, in the shared cell and uh, sets the state uh, to empty and uh, notifies the uh, consumer that there is a new item in this uh, thread and it goes away. Therefore you can see that uh, the producer and consumer can be synchronized. Now um, uh, to implement uh, producer uh, the producer is a thread. It extends the thread class, uh, as you can see uh, here. And the thread class uh, has a reference of the object uh, shared cell. And uh, we also define an um, optional uh, variable stop that uh, we use it just for the logic of the producer. Whenever, if you want to later stop this thread from producing, and the producer in its constructor get a reference from a shared cell, as you can see. Uh, so the producer has a set to stop, which is, uh, as I mentioned, for later uh, being able to uh, instruct the producer to stop, uh, and however, the uh, important part is the implementation of the run method uh, which is inherited from the class thread and the logic of the producer to be running uh, as an independent thread. So as you can see uh, we uh, define while it is not instructed uh, to be stopped it continues to generate a random number uh, between 0 to 100 uh, and uh, then it put, calls the put method which is a synchronized method uh, from the shared cell therefore it could happen that this thread by calling this method uh, have to wait until uh, the shared cell gets empty Otherwise, it just puts the item and returns. And we also define a uh, sleep uh, by the same amount of milliseconds uh, between 0 and 100 uh, in order to not to make the uh, CPU to be used uh, like constantly producing results therefore there is a s small pause between uh, productions and consumptions and um, that's the producer and the consumer is also uh, a, a class that inherits the uh, thread class and uh, it has a reference from the shared cell and uh, we define it uh, its logic as the, uh, that it will be set from its constructor to be running uh, for n number of times. Uh, and in the uh, in its run method, that uh, it will run for uh, n number of times, uh, calling the take method of the shared cell which in case that there is no item in the shared cell it has to wait until an item will be produced and after uh, getting the item it prints out the item this is a simple logic just to demonstrate the synchronization of producer and consumer and a test application for running the producer consumer example is by we call this class exchange and we define a main method uh, 
and we instantiate an object of the shared cell and a producer and a consumer uh, we define the to be running at uh, consumer consumes 10 times and we start the threads and we instruct the join the consumer uh, to uh, we instruct the main thread to wait for the consumer because we know that it's a, um, a finite uh, uh, it runs for finite number of times which is in case consumes 10 times and whenever uh, this thread uh, comes out of running 10 times the main thread will be uh, released uh, uh, will be uh, continuing from this point and uh, the main thread can set the stop uh, variable call the stop uh, set the stop method of the uh, producer thread and therefore the producer thread uh, if it is uh, in a wait state we can call interrupt to uh, therefore uh, come to come back to running state and uh, to therefore it will check it a state that is set uh, to stop and returns from the run method and uh, therefore uh, the application runs for a finite number of times in the second example um, we will see synchronized bounded buffer which is a bounded buffer and has actually several uh, slots uh, for putting items so this class therefore requires a, an array of objects for example uh, to keep the items and uh, pointers to keep track of the front and rear and the number of items in this uh, buffer and the size of this bounded buffer will be uh, defined in the construction time as in the shared cell it has two methods put and uh, take which both of these methods are again uh, synchronized uh, as you can see and uh, these two methods their conditions uh, needs to be uh, by uh, checking the count for example in this case uh, that we can see that if the count reaches to n it means that the uh, bounded buffer is full uh, therefore the uh, thread that is trying to put an item needs to wait and uh, if it is not full therefore the item uh, can be added to this uh, thread uh, to this uh, excuse me uh, bounded buffer and note that this bounded buffer is designed to be used by multiple consumers and producers at the same time uh, therefore uh, the threads before going out of the uh, before releasing the lock uh, they need to call notify all uh, in order to avoid um, a deadlock happening uh, because if you just call notify what could happen is that in the end of the day you call and uh, the, the current thread uh, just signals another consumer another producer in this case and the producer uh, will face a full uh, queue and uh, therefore uh, it goes waiting and therefore all the producers and consumers at the same time will be w waiting for a signal and therefore there will be no progress which is called dead lock and the consumer side um, the condition is for zero if the number of items in the uh, bounded buffer zero uh, therefore uh, the consumer should wait uh, otherwise it can just take the uh, first item in the bounded buffer and uh, updates the uh, 
counter and the uh, pointer and uh, again notify all before exiting the uh, monitor object there are concurrent utilities in Java uh, that provide a concurrent framework uh, f uh, for uh, that provide a framework for programming uh, concurrent uh, applications and multi-threaded applications that uh, can uh, make your life easier there are locks and conditions that we will explain them with an example there are uh, synchronizers that can be used uh, including semaphores, mutexes uh, barriers, uh, barriers and latches and exchangers and there is this executor framework also that we will explain in this lecture that are used for scheduling uh, execution and control of asynchronous tasks in fact it en enables you to create a threat pool that uh, uh, you can use a uh, bounded number of threads uh, and receiving uh, tasks to assign to this bounded number of threads and there are also nanosecond granularity timing uh, for measuring uh, and using your uh, concurrent program for timestamps and time estimates and the it also provides atomic variables uh, that you can manipulate uh, single variables atomically and avoiding uh, kind of uh, race conditions like atomic boolean, atomic integer and long and also there is for object references and arrays like uh, atomic references and uh, you can also imp uh, it, these uh, atomic variables are used to implement also concurrent collections uh, such as queues and blocking queues uh, uh, with, uh, that provides the inter these interfaces and uh, there are also concurrent implementations of map, list and queue okay in this section uh, we explain locks and conditions locks and conditions uh, provide, uh, provide more sophisticated uh, way of threat synchronization uh, than uh, synchronized uh, methods and synchronized blocks. Uh, there are classes and interfaces uh, provided as a threat synchronization framework in the packages uh, concurrent.locks and uh, there is uh, a, a reintrend lock class uh, that is an implementation of the interface lock that uh, represents a reintrant mutual exclusion lock and by uh, reintrant uh, it means that a lock itself uh, a thread itself that has acquired already a lock can uh, for multiple times uh, or any times uh, many any number of times uh, ac reacquired uh, the lock that it holds itself therefore it will not block itself and it allows to create uh, condition variables to wait for conditions and the condition interface is to define a condition associated with a lock and you can uh, create a several number of uh, conditions on a lock and it allows one thread to suspend uh, execution uh, until uh, being notified by another thread uh, on that condition uh, signaling on that condition and the suspended thread in that moment releases the lock uh, And reintern locks are monitors, in fact, that are that allow uh, blocking on a condition. And uh, the threads can acquire and release a lock and wait on a condition to summarize. So here is an interface of the lock. Actually, my, a thread can release and can acquire and release a lock by the methods lock and unlock. And also, um, it can try uh, to acquire the lock which is a non-blocking operation 
uh, that in fact the thread uh, when uh, when it calls try lock uh, it uh, if the lock is not acquired by any thread it therefore uh, hold, uh, acquires the lock otherwise if the lock is uh, ac already acquired by another thread uh, it just uh, returns false and uh, continue to do something else you can actually write uh, your logic to continue uh, for the thread to do something else so it's an unblocking operation it will not hold it uh, infinitely trying to acquire the lock infinitely and the try uh, lock can be also with a uh, timeout therefore for that amount of time it will the thread can wait to acquire the lock otherwise to release it to to uh, like uh, cancel trying and also uh, the, the way that to define new conditions uh, on the lock is by uh, the calling method new condition which is straightforward we will see it in an example and the lock interruptibly uh, as you can see it can throw interruptible uh, interrupted exception which means that actually uh, your thread uh, if it calls uh, lock inter if, if it acquires lock interruptibly uh, means that it can being it, it can be interrupted by other threads while it holds lock and the condition uh, interface uh, includes uh, methods await and signals which are straightforward method await means uh, the current thread uh, will uh, wait uh, and uh, on the condition and being suspended and will wait until another thread call signal method to wake uh, to awaken the the, the uh, suspended thread so await for releasing lock and waiting on a condition and signal to wake on waiting uh, wake up one waiting thread and signal all to wake up all waiting threads and uh to just um, summarize, we can see that uh, on a condition, when a thread calls await, uh, it actually uh, releases lock associated with the condition Q. So uh, it doesn't have the Q anymore and it sleeps, uh, therefore will be suspended. And then it will be awakened uh, when the signal is called or signal all and therefore it re acquires the lock but when the signal and signal all are called uh, b uh, on the condition it uh, awakens one or multiple threads we get back to our block blocking bounded buffer example but this time we implement it with a lock based approach so therefore we uh, define a uh, new instance of the reinterned lock and two conditions we create two conditions uh, not full and not empty so as you can see uh, not full can be used uh, by producers in case that the bounded buffer is actually full therefore they can wait on this condition until being signaled that now uh, it is not full and not empty can be used by consumers in case that the bounded buffer is empty uh, to being signaled by consumers uh, by producers excuse me that uh, this uh, bounded buffer is actually not empty anymore so they can uh, continue to consume so we write this condition for uh, being weighted on with the uh, producers right and this one for being weighted with consumers and the same as before uh, the logic for having a bounded buffer and uh, now going back to the methods put and take therefore we don't need to write any synchronized modifier anymore here 
right? But the threads, when they enter, they need to acquire a lock, the lock, right? And therefore, a producer, if it see that uh, the bounded buffer is full, uh, therefore it waits for the condition not full to be signaled. And whenever the condition is true, uh, that uh, it is not full anymore, they, uh, a threat can, a producer can uh, update the counters and put its value in a bounded buffer and signal a consumer uh, that is actually uh, not empty anymore. Uh, therefore, as you can see, the producer will not signal all because now the conditions are fine-grained and there are two conditions. One condition that is uh, for producers and one condition that is for consumers. And therefore, a producer can only, uh, it, can o it has this option to call only uh, to signal a, another um, uh, consumer and it doesn't need to awaken producers also and in the finally block uh, we unlock the code and we put it in the finally uh, block because if any exception happens in any case the current thread can release the lock therefore avoiding any a deadlock that could happen in cases of exception. For the consumers, it is uh, the same. It needs to a uh, consumer thread needs to acquire the lock, and it needs to wait on the not empty uh, condition in case that the bounded buffer is empty, and uh, it consumes and updates uh, the bounded buffer and signals uh, a producer. Uh, that um, this time uh, uh, it signals the producer that uh, the bounded buffer is uh, not full anymore so a producer can uh, awake, be awakened and continue producing and filling uh, the bounded buffer and unlocking there are uh, cases that uh, you want to actually have uh, asynchronous tasks and uh, you want to schedule, execute them uh, with concurrent threads according to a set of execution policies. And that's uh, where uh, executor frameworks come uh, handy. Uh, executors, uh, executor framework allows you to create a threat pool and you can assign the tasks to this pool of threads. An executor uh, object actually then creates uh, can uh, can be created to execute uh, submitted tasks. For example, here you can see that uh, actually um, uh, one can define a uh, pool of thread with a fixed uh, number of uh, threads let's say you can for example assign five threads for this and uh, you it, this one ensures you that there will be f a thread pool of uh, five threads and uh, then you can just assign your tasks to be executed and uh, the, your tasks will be executed uh, asynchronously You can assume uh, several cases, use cases for this. Let's say uh, if you have a um, if you have a search engine, uh, a single server search engine uh, that clients, uh, let's say it has like hundreds of uh, requests per second, uh, and uh, however the number of uh, requests uh, can fluctuate. Go. Uh, up and down at different times. You don't want to actually create for every request a new thread because it, at the times that uh, there are high number of requests you may create 
uh, so many uh, threads and your task uh, execution time if it's uh, more than the uh, uh, number of uh, requests per second then you overflow your system with uh, threads and it therefore it just uh, overflows the resources uh, that uh, each thread consumes and it will crash uh, your uh, server service that uh, is in this case a search engine service so in this case you want to have a fixed number of threads let's say you assign 50 threads to be uh, responsible for client request and therefore uh, you can uh, ensure that uh, at some times uh, clients may face an overloaded service and a long service time but at least your service will not crash So uh, an executor can have uh, one of the following interfaces. A simple interface executor uh, provides a uh, execute method, uh, an execute method uh, that accepts a runnable task. And there are uh, more sophisticated uh, interface like executor service that actually has additional features uh, to manage lifecycle and to launch and control the tasks and callback tasks such as a uh, future that represents the result of an asynchronous computation there are even more sophisticated one that actually uh, you, it, that it supports for future or periodic execution and uh, again for scheduling runnable and callable tasks In this example, uh, I show uh, using an executor in a simple service that actually this service gets uh, input text from the clients and reverse the text and return the text to the client. So as you can see, uh, first we define the handler, uh, which is in fact a um, implements a runnable therefore it is a task and uh, therefore since it's uh, this handler needs to uh, uh, this handler class is in fact a task that needs to uh, handle client requests therefore it receives this socket uh, instances of the socket as uh, uh, in the construction time during the construction I mean and uh, the run method where the logic of the task will uh, be right uh, we can see that uh, we define a buffered reader to get the input stream from the socket there where we can uh, get the clients input and also we create a printer writer to write to the client and here uh, we write it such that uh, it reads uh, every line of the text coming from the client and uh, it reverse it and print it to the client back and uh, we close the socket so this is the task is doing and uh, now in our uh, server class that is the main class we want to use uh, create uh, the instances of these tasks and use it for each client request so we, we assign a port number a static port number this is just for example for this uh, exercise or it's better to say example not exercise so the pool size we assume uh, in this example is three this ensures that this um, server will assign three threads to handle client requests, not more. And the server socket, um, it it can uh, receive the uh, pool size also from the input, 
if uh, anything is set so these are uh, not uh, really the main uh, part of the example so we instantiate the server socket and uh, in case that the port number is uh, occupied or by any, by any other process it throws an exception and returns uh, here as you can see uh, we uh, create an executor service instance and uh, the server will be running infinitely and waiting uh, always for the client requests as you can see and whenever a request uh, um, uh, arrives uh, it creates a, a new task here the server creates a new task and uh, actually uh, give a reference of the socket uh, to this uh, instance and uh, the executor will exit it now you can assume different scenarios where the number of requests are uh, high or low and the clients could uh, continue uh, sending uh, uh, text and you can see that the life uh, time of the each handler uh, each task is until a uh, user sen uh, is sending the text uh, and it will work uh, until the client uh, uh, stops sending any text or sends the end of the uh, text that he wants to send so uh, this is an example of the executor Java Collections uh, framework uh, mm, provide the uh, implementations and interfaces uh, for useful data structures such as hash set, link list, array list, hash map uh, or uh, several other stream map uh, that are very uh, common and useful data structures in programming and um, uh, also vectors and uh, you are already familiar uh, with the data structures used in uh, programming however also in the package uh, util concurrent there are concurrent version of these collections if you want to use it in a multi-threaded uh, context multi-threading context um, so therefore these concurrent collections extend uh, the java collection framework and uh, provide the concurrent version of the uh, uh, data structures uh, such as queue, blocking queue, blocking DQ interfaces and also high performance implementation of the uh, concurrent maps, list and queues such uh, concurrent uh, collections are like concurrent hash map copy and write array list copy and write array set and there are also different uh, uh, these concurrent uh, data structures are different from the synchronized classes uh, and um, uh, they, uh, they are threat safe but not governed with a single exclusion uh, lock uh, for example, concurrent hash map, uh, you can um, permit any number of concurrent reads as well as a tunable number of concurrent writes, which increases the throughput and the scalability of that. So, when to use uh, which of these type of data structures on synchronized, synchronized, and concurrent collections? You can use unsynchronized collections, uh, 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 preferably when uh, they are not shared, and they are accessib accessible only uh, when they are holding uh, threads holding a lock. So, uh, when there is a, a mutual exclusion defined. However, uh, when you need to govern all accesses to a collection via a single lock, then you can use uh, the synchronized version. However, since you just let one thread at a time uh, by governing uh, all accesses with a single lock, this uh, could uh, cost uh, a poorer scalability. And 
normally uh, concurrent versions are more preferable, preferable uh, than synchronized versions of the data structures because it lets multiple threads uh, to access a common collection and they are usually more efficient. So uh, thank you so much uh, for attending this lecture. I hope that uh, you have learned and grasped the uh, concepts of multi-threading uh, with Java in this lecture.